Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the Secretary of State outlines what voters need to know for the November election, and a key lawmaker has the latest on chronic wasting disease in the deer population, plus how the University of Minnesota plans to manage COVID-19 in residence halls. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Election season is upon us and voters may be wondering what options are available to vote this November. There is no better person to answer these questions than the Secretary of State, Steve Simon. I spoke with him this week. In this time of unprecedented events, this coming fall election has some unprecedented challenges. For example, there's the potential disruptions with the Postal Service. There is a global pandemic and there's possible foreign interference. Are you worried? Well, it's my job to be worried. It's my job to game these things out and think about the worst possible scenario. That's what we do and not just in our office, what our partners at the counties and cities do. So we're in constant contact with one another as teammates. I'm on multiple calls a week, large Zoom calls with uh, county administrators and city clerks and others thinking through all those things. So am I worried? Well, yeah, it's my job to be worried. I would say that having an election, a statewide election in a time of a pandemic is a big, big challenge. And I think most people who are in this work at the county or city level too, we agree that we have to view this through a public health lens, at least to some extent. And that's what we're doing. Um, and part of it comes down to um, a math problem, really, to be honest. And the math is this. We've got uh, about 3,000 polling places in Minnesota, and we're expecting about 3 million voters in Minnesota. That may be a cautious or conservative number. That math works out quite easily to 1,000 people per polling place. On average, very rough average, some places lower, some places higher, but a working average is 1,000 per polling place. And from a public health standpoint, we want to try to get that number down. That would be a good thing because you're talking about a thousand people and their droplets circulating in close quarters, tight quarters, over a 13 hour period, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Those are the poll hours in Minnesota. I vote at a church a few blocks away from where I'm talking to you. It's in the basement of a church. There is not a lot of room down there to expand or grow or go to other places. So we're trying to get that number down Balancing with that, everyone's right to vote in the polling place, of course. Um, we are urging people to strongly consider voting from home. It takes five minutes maximum at a website, mnvotes.org. And when you go to mnvotes.org, you type in your information and it comes right to you. So that's the primary focus right in front of us is treating this as a public health event, which it is. You mentioned a lot of things in that question. I'm sure we'll get to right. them in the podcast, but there are yes, a number. Because my next question then, you, you are encouraging absentee ballots, you know, people request their absentee ballot, cast it, then therefore they don't have to go to the polling place. But what impact are these potential problems with the Postal Service going to have on the ability to cast that absentee ballot? Well, so am I concerned and even outraged by the reports about delays at the Postal Service, things were, which were avoidable, things which were conscious decisions which resulted in delays? Of course I am. But does that stop me in any way from urging people to, um, to vote from home this year if that's uh, an option that they're comfortable with? No, it does not stop me. It's full steam ahead. And here's why. We have multiple workarounds to accommodate even delays, starting with a message I'll give now, which is folks should go to mnvotes.org even if they think they might vote from home. I say that because that decision is reversible. You can change your mind. So whatever you do, don't wait until late October. Because if you do that, you're going to slam people right when they shouldn't get slammed. That's when elections administrators in counties and cities at their absolute wit's end, at their absolute busiest. And in other states during the primary process where they saw real chaos, part of it could be traced to that, people waiting to the last minute. So go to mnvotes.org now. Number two, workaround of postal delays, is once you know your choices, get your ballot in. It's everyone's right to wait until election day, of course, to get that last morsel of information from the day before, the last ad, the last debate. But if you're a person who knows who you're gonna vote for a week out or two weeks out or three weeks out, nothing's gonna change your mind, get the ballot in. Third, and this is critical and crucial, this year and this year only, very on brand for 2020, this year and this year only, because of some litigation that resulted in a standing court order, which no one is appealing. All the parties, everyone is agreeing with this, okay? It's no longer the subject of debate. We have a new rule for getting your ballot in. 
The rule only for this year is it can be postmarked as late as election day, November 3rd, as long as it gets in a week later by November 10th. What that means in terms of your question about the mail is there's an automatic one week buffer period built in. No matter how late you go, even if you're a procrastinator or you do it at the last possible second, you can have no fewer than seven days of a buffer between getting that ballot from point A to point B. That is a huge, huge work around any potential postal delays. Next, I would say, just keep in mind that because you get, just because you get the ballot by mail doesn't mean you have to return it that way. You are free to hand deliver the ballot to the address that's on the envelope, or uh, you can have someone you know and trust deliver it for you. So there are multiple workarounds. And then another one uh, I forgot, which is we have a feature on our website, mnvotes.org, where you can track your ballot. You don't have to just pop it in the and say a little prayer and hope somehow that it gets there. You can know with certainty whether it has. You go to mnvotes.org, you type in your information. I did this myself for the primary, and it will tell you the exact date that it has arrived, and it will tell you in black and white that it is being processed or it has been processed. So those are some of the workarounds we have. Yes, is it unfortunate that there are postal delays? Of course it is. Are some of the reports outrageous? Sure. But is that going to slow down democracy in Minnesota? No, it's not. This is a year during a pandemic when a very safe and effective option and one that really is in many ways a public service, meaning that everyone who votes from home is making the polling place just a little bit safer for those who choose that option. In this year of all years, it's full steam ahead. People should strongly consider using the mail and voting from home. Now, you mentioned that you can track your ballot once you send it back in. Let's say you've sent it back in, you're tracking it, it's not showing up, it's not showing up, it's not showing up. What do you do then? Yeah, and it happens, you know, it's just bound to happen uh, sometimes. Um, there are uh, two options, well, I guess three options, depending on when in the calendar or how soon before election day. One is just to order another one and have it come to you and that is done from time to time. If there isn't enough time, if we're talking like three days before the election, four days before the election, then there are still two remaining options. In-person absentee. There are two ways to vote absentee. One is to go to mnvotes.org, order the ballot to come to you at home. The other is to drop by either your city hall or a county office. And if you don't know where that place is, go to that same website and, and, and we'll tell you. So you can vote in-person absentee on any day up to the day before the election, the Monday before the Tuesday. And then finally, and maybe obviously, even though that might not have been your first choice, you still always have the option of going in and voting on election day. So just because you've ordered an absentee ballot doesn't mean you're locked into that choice. I'm glad you said that because that actually was one of my questions. You know, if you order an absentee, but you are like me and you really want to go to the polling place, if right. you can, because it's part of the whole experience, right. you know, do you have that option? And the answer is yes, you do have that option. Absolutely, you do. So you can change your mind. Or maybe your hand was forced because of the scenario you just laid out. You wanted to vote from home, you mailed it in, and you're pushing refresh constantly to see if it's gotten in and it hasn't. And, you're, and you just figure, well, I got to go in and do it myself. One more question, actually two more questions before you go. How is foreign election interference impacting this election? It's not something we've talked about as much as maybe in prior elections, but is it still happening? So um, it's still a crucially and critically important issue. Obviously, COVID-19 has kind of blotted out the sun when it comes to coverage and scrutiny and attention, but this is absolutely still an issue. I and a few members of my staff got a confidential intelligence briefing on exactly this subject at the FBI headquarters. We're gonna get at least one more before the uh, general election. We are right now undergoing our latest round of penetration testing that the Department of Homeland Security is for exactly this purpose, where they both come into our office and remotely basically test our systems. In essence, try to hack us to find out where the soft spots are. So we've been getting those briefings. We've been acting on their recommendations in terms of what we need to do to harden our systems. So we're very much uh, paying attention to that but we feel cautiously optimistic about where we are, not only in Minnesota, but as a country. And then finally, because people will have up to a week after election day uh, for their ballot to be counted, and also because you are strongly encouraging people to take advantage of that absentee ballot, how long will it be before we potentially know some of the outcomes of some of these elections? I'm glad you used the word you just said you use the word outcomes and you're one of the first people to do that and good for you because um, I want to distinguish between results and outcomes. So in every state in America this year, election night is going to look 
a little different than what we're used to. And I just want to make sure everyone understands that going in. So when you see, not if, when you see on election night that you don't have 100% of the results, don't blame your county or your city. Don't assume that someone fell asleep at the switch or fell down on the job. No, this is literally by design by design of the Minnesota legislature this year in giving more time to count ballots and by design of the courts in what is now an agreed to non-appealable um, court order that I mentioned earlier, which is that we now have election day plus seven days to get the ballots in. So that means by definition, we won't know the final results until seven days after the election day, but you use a key word, which is outcomes. I predict for what it's worth that we will know the vast majority of outcomes well before that. We might not know final vote tallies, but outcomes. So we are working hard in our office to get as detailed information as we can absentee ballots. So let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say on election night in a legislative contest, candidate A is ahead of candidate B by a thousand votes. And we're able to announce either on election night or shortly thereafter that there are in that race 700 absentee ballots left to count, outstanding absentee ballots. Well, you can call that race, right? Candidate A has won. She's ahead by 1,000 votes. There are only 700 votes left to count. Even if they all go for her opponent, mathematically, she is still won. So will we know the result of that election? No, we won't know by how much she's won. Was it a lot? Was it a little? Was it two points? Was it five points? But we will know the outcome. I think in the vast majority of cases, we will sooner rather than later, if not on election night, shortly thereafter, I don't know what shortly means, but shortly thereafter, we'll have the vast majority of outcomes. We'll know the winners. We won't have to wait a week, I think, in the vast majority of cases. Secretary of State, Steve Simon, I want to thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. House and Senate Environment Committees held a virtual meeting this week for an update on the state's management of chronic wasting disease in the deer population. CWD remains a rare disease in Minnesota, which is still a good thing. Uh, we do have it in certain areas, but we have it at very low levels, and we're working diligently to try to continue to have it um, be less present <laughs> or uh, at least less risk in other parts of our state. Um, we have an aggressive approach that's maintained here through our hunting season. Even though our sampling became voluntary, we have changed nothing in our aggressive approach to managing the disease with the number of available licenses and tags. Sorry, in our harvest strategies, we're going to continue with culling this coming winter. So all of those tools are still in place and extremely important in trying to manage this disease. Um, we will adapt as we can to make sure that we remain effective in our work and that we cannot be successful without the help of our hunters and cooperators and businesses and landowners in this effort, because uh, we all have to be in this together to make sure that we can do the best we can for this resource. Representative Jamie Becker Finn is the vice chair of the House Environment and Natural Resources Policy Committee. I spoke with her this week about how well the state is managing chronic wasting disease as we approach deer hunting season. I wanted to speak with you for a long time because you are an avid hunter. And so regarding deer hunting and chronic wasting disease, you bring a unique perspective, both a personal one and a policy one. So from that joint perspective, how is Minnesota doing in managing chronic wasting disease? So the short answer is that we're doing better than we were previously, but there's still a lot more to do. Um, if For anyone who's familiar with chronic wasting disease, this isn't going to be an easy disease to tackle. Um, but I think particularly in the last two years, um, the DNR has really um, made some important steps and we've been able to make some important changes in the legislature, uh, both with funding and changing some policy issues to hopefully keep this disease in check. So last year, the legislature provided uh, funds for further research efforts at the University of Minnesota to develop more robust diagnostic tools, including, I think, the development of field tests. How is the research progressing right now? Um, we actually got really good news at our hearing yesterday 
Uh, so Dr. Peter Larson at the University of Minnesota has really been the one leading the way on this. And I can't say enough good things about um, him and his team and the work they've been putting, putting into this. And so what they shared with us yesterday is that they are making important strides in um, a lot of it was really technical, but uh, essentially they've, they're developing and getting closer to a test that uh, can, um, essentially it's a much more sensitive test. So previously we had to have, um, in order to find the prions, we had to have um, brain tissue or spinal tissue, you know, areas where the, um, the prions were higher. And so this new test that they are working on would be able to detect it in saliva, blood, urine, um, or even the dirt. And it, so it's a much, much more uh, sensitive test and they are starting to invest in the equipment and moving forward on that. Um, Obviously, we'd still, you know, be using their labs and such, but um, really important strides that we're making um, really exciting stuff that's happening because right now, um, hunters are having to find like specific tissue samples and the wait several days, if not weeks to get their results. And the turnaround on this more sensitive test is also much quicker. Um, still some technical issues to get it rolled out to the public, but um, things are looking really good. Have you heard anything specific from hunters who don't want to go through the rigmarole of testing a deer, so they just simply are not following the recommendations? Um, so obviously, I'm not hearing from most people uh, because that would be, uh, you know, they would be following the law uh, if that's what they were doing. Uh, one important thing to note um, that we did hear from the DNR, and, and some of us had been given sort of a heads up uh, when they were sending the, the booklets. So you get a booklet every year uh, from the DNR with all your hunting rules and regulations in it. And because of COVID-19, they will not have staff out in the field um, testing hunter harvested deer. And so um, it's going to be voluntary this year and there will be essentially drop sites uh, throughout the impacted areas, the different zones that are considered CWD zones. And so we really are going to rely on hunters voluntarily complying with this. And um, another piece to that is that part of the work that um, some of the funds to the U of M uh, and the CIDRAP, uh, so the Center for Prion Research, uh, and the work they're doing is um, they 3D printed a head of a deer with, so you can see the lymph nodes and they can really, and so the idea was hopefully they would be able to go out to the communities and show people, you know, really hands on what the samples are that they need. Um, so it'll be a little bit more challenging this year, but uh, we certainly are hearing from deer hunters that this is an important issue. And so, um, you know, most folks feel like it's worth it um, to make sure that we're, we're finding the disease and that um, hopefully we're not consuming it as well. Is it the goal then, because my understanding is these prions live in the environment for quite some time, is the goal really to just keep the spread under control as much as humanly possible? Yes, and I think, um, you know, we all uh, maybe now in COVID times have a little bit um, more nuanced understanding of disease, uh, disease control and how we manage disease. And so that's really what we're looking at is managing it. And, uh, you know, as I noted before, you know, the sort of the level of prions found in um, different tissues or the environment is also going to be really critical. Uh, for instance, in our the dumpster program that we started last year to make sure people are um, disposing of their deer carcasses, you know, the, the parts that they don't eat uh, safely, you know, it's probably, it, it's fine that that goes to a landfill. And, um, you know, in the grand scheme of how much else is in that landfill, you know, the chances that somebody's going to, or another animal is going to consume enough of uh, a deer part to get the disease uh, it is relatively rare, but that would be different than you eating a steak, a venison steak, um, you know, fresh from the from the field. So uh, it it's it's managing all of that and keeping it in check so it doesn't spread any further um, than than we can keep it from spreading. But yeah, the the chances that we are going to completely eradicate CWD um, at this point. Um, 
aren't looking too good, but I think that we really can keep it managed in a way that um, it's not negatively impacting your average hunter or average family or average Minnesotan who cares about the deer population. Now this coming budget year is going to be a challenge because of the projected deficit, meaning that those financial resources that any number of state agencies rely on are scarcer and scarcer. So as a lawmaker planning for you know, reduced budget figures, how important is it that funding remain for the management of chronic wasting disease? Uh, I, I think it's still really important. Obviously, uh, everything that we're going to be trying to be funding next year is going to be really a challenge. Uh, but I think there, for a couple of reasons, I think, um, you know, once this disease, if this disease were truly to get out of control, it would be really difficult, if not impossible, to sort of like force it back into the box. And so I think the timing is really critical because we are at a stage right now where you know, in the last year, we've had three new positives show up in three different, or, you know, more than three, but three different counties that are now sort of on the radar of having to be managed uh, for chronic wasting disease, two of those from, uh, you know, a, a deer farm situation. And so um, we're going to, we're going to have to find a way. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to have to get creative and overall in dealing with this problem, you know, we know that some of the positives are connected to um, kind of the for-profit farming sector, and those are managed through the Board of Animal Health, which is different than the DNR because the DNR is managing it as, as the wild deer population as a natural resource. However, um, they're the same species, and so they still can interact through a fence or uh, deer escape from their enclosures. And so we may be looking at, um, you know, we're all going to have to work together to figure out how to pay for this. Um, I do think um, historically that hunters have borne most of the burden to manage this disease through uh, license sales. Uh, but the, the research that's currently going on at the U of M was actually funded through um, the, through, uh, the ENTRF. So um, the trust fund dollars or lottery mm -hmm. dollars paid for some of that. And right. so we do have some options here in Minnesota that other states may not have. Representative Jamie Becker Finn, that is all the time we have, but I want to thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me and thanks for paying attention to chronic wasting disease. Also this week, University of Minnesota President Joan Gable outlined their COVID preparedness plan for managing students who choose to live on campus. We have uh, added another chapter to the University Sunrise Plan that we're calling the Maroon and Gold Sunrise. Of course we are. And the Maroon and Gold Sunrise is how we are going to move students into university housing. It is a phased approach. It still uses the hybrid course delivery of some face-to-face, -face, some hybrid, some distance learning that you've heard from everybody uh, in the private schools and in the Minnesota state system. So this plan refers specifically to how we now reopen university housing and actually bring students back to campus on the Twin Cities, Duluth and Rochester campuses. In the first phase, which will start a little earlier in Duluth than in the Twin Cities and Rochester, just because of how the class schedules work, Students will move into university housing for an average of 10 days, depending on when they move in. They will be in sort of the dorm version of a stay at home um, order where they can leave to attend classes, to eat, to exercise if they have to work. Um, there are what I would call common sense exceptions, but otherwise they should stay um, at home, which would become their dorm room. Um, if that phase or step goes well using a holistic review that I'll detail for you at the end because I know you'd uh, like to learn more about that, then we would move to the next step. Step two opens access to more campus facilities, the rec, library, student unions, the surrounding community, and asks that students be home by 9 p.m. with also the same common sense exceptions. Um, if they work or have other um, reasonable reasons that they would have to be out later than that. If that goes well, using the same holistic review, we would extend the be home by time to midnight for two more weeks. 
And if that goes well, we would remove the be home by uh, limit and students would be on campus doing what students do in what we are now calling COVID normal, wearing masks six feet apart, avoiding large gatherings, but otherwise able to access all of campus facilities. It is really an odd time, I understand that. But could you, for me, President Gable, you mentioned in your comments that you would like to do all that you can to create an environment where students would want to come on campus. And I didn't really, from my perspective, I didn't really hear many, many bullet points that would make a student want to come on campus. It sounded to me like uh, a stay at home plan in a 12 foot by 15 foot dormitory room uh, could be problematic on numerous levels, particularly uh, mental health, uh, but also just the, uh, the loss of autonomy. I don't think I could be anything but honest with you to say that that first period um, is not gonna be much fun, right? It's not going to be zero fun, but it's going to be a very tamped down level of campus life while we reintegrate on the Twin Cities campus and certainly in Duluth, thousands of students all at one time into an ecosystem. But this is the way that we think we can do it and then sustain it. But if we can do this right in a matter of less than two weeks, then we start to open things up again. And it starts to feel a lot more like the new normal. I know we all hate that phrase, but where you can go to different things, you can um, be out and do, you can have study group meetings and you can meet with your professor if they're on campus and you can go off campus and eat. You just get home before um, the biggest temptation starts. And um, if that goes well, then we start to um, open things up gradually. So we feel like this is the, the way to balance exactly what you're saying. Uh, it, it, but it gets a lot more fun over time if we make the hard choices in the beginning. What would you tell the legislature would be the most help for you in trying to, you know, if you would, almost in an emperor kind of fashion, you get to decide and you get to tell the legislature what it is you'd like us to do to make your job easier and the student experience better. First and foremost, we always appreciate, as Chancellor Maholtra mentioned, the investment by the state into higher education. I would be remiss if I didn't start with appreciation for the, um, the way in which resources solve so many of our challenges. But with that said, um, over time, uh, real support for the partnership between what all of us are doing that have large groups of people together and um, what's happening to support our ability to do the research into vaccines, mitigating treatment, and cheap, fast testing. Um, we have the scientists to do it. Um, it's just a question of the investment into those things. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.